So today is bacterial motility, right? So I already did a hang drop. I don't usually mess with wet mounts, and, and they'll make sense when we go through um, this because there are some complications with those, and I just find that the hang drop just comes out better. It's a little bit more technically challenging, right? Um, as far as focusing at oil, as you guys saw, um, I had to be real careful with that. Um, but, you know, with a little bit of practice, it's really worth the extra effort because um, you usually get the best re best um, results and don't have to worry about any false results or complications if done right. Um, so for lab um, exercise 311, we just refer to um, the flagella arrangements, and I have that added into this PowerPoint. So I have pictures in the terms for that. We don't do the flagella stain in this lab, um, and I've tried it in the summer with my students, um, my STEM students, and unfortunately couldn't get it to work. And I did it years ago, so I don't, I don't understand what we're not doing right. Um, but needless to say, it's not an <laughs> easy technique. So once you guys, though, do find out what your bacteria is, you could go look it up um, on the Internet and find out, like, how many flagella and how they're arranged um, for your organism. A lot of them are what we call uh, perichicus. They're completely covered in flagella. Um, so we're not seeing the flagella, right? But we know that that one probably has flagella uh, because I know the organisms that we're working with. And we're not working with any spirochetes, right, um, which could corkscrew through. Um, so pretty much all we're dealing with is flagella uh, motility. So the motility test is that stab tube that we've just been looking at and we're going to talk about. Um, and that we can tell if they spread out that they're modal. But there are, again, complications um, with that test that may not give you accurate readings. Um, so you don't want to rely on just a single test. The uh, fluothioglycolate uh, media, this one we use to determine if your organism can grow anaerobically because this media has an anaerobic zone. Um, so we ask the question with this media, can your organism grow anaerobically? But it also tells us, too, if yours is an aerobe, if it'll only grow in the oxygen zone. The anaerobic jar, we no longer do this experiment. We have the jars down here. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have enough jars for all classes to do the experiment, and these are a couple hundred dollars a piece. Um, several of them, the seals don't stay um, airtight anymore um, and uh, they keep cutting our funding so no more jars um, but it's just one experiment so I've taken pictures right and we can talk about it you guys are still responsible for the information as it relates to this experiment even though we're not going to do it so read an in-class discussion we're not doing the experiment but you're still responsible for it so as I said, there are several terms that relate to how many flagella and where they're arranged on your bacteria. So if your bacteria is polar or monotrichous, which actually the um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in that poster over there, that one is um, got a single flagella at one end of its rod. Um, I thought they had a picture of it on that. I think they might under one of the flip-up things. So that's a having one flagellum at one end of the bacteria. And typically, a lot of the ones that are modal, like we saw for this one, they're rod-shaped. There are a few cocci that have flagella, but they're very rare. Amphitrichus is the term having one flagella at either end. So they have two flagella, right, one at each end. Lophotrichus trichus refers to hair-like, is having a clustering of two or more flagella at one end or both ends. Mostly it means multiple flagella, right, at a particular polar end. And again, since it tends to be at the end, right, when they have a single flagella, sometimes it's referred to as polar, right, it's at the end, at the pole of the organism. Perichicus is my favorite. Multiple flagella covering the entire surface of the bacterium. They look like scary cousin it from the Adams family. 
I like that people still know what I'm talking about when I say that. It's rare, but, you know, those of us like vintage stuff. Okay, so what's this one? It's completely covered, right? This is Gary Cousin It. This is Perry Trichus. Perry meaning many. Right? And these guys tend to tumble and run around. So I can tell you the one that we're looking at that's forming those chains too, it's Perry Trichus. Right? So hence again the, the kind of tumbling around movement that it has. Um, this next one is a single flagella, right? So it would be what? Monotrichus or polar. And these guys can swim in pretty straight lines. They can really dart around pretty straight. What? And so the shape of these two is what? Bacillus, or rod-shaped, right? These two are spirillium. Not spirochetes, but spirillium, right? Spirochetes, remember, are helical. It's going to be much tighter turns. These guys are rigid, right? They're not flexible like the spirochetes. Uh, but notice that there are multiple flagella at both ends for this one. So just having multiple flagella at, at an end is which term? This is LOFO, right? And one flagella at each end? Amphi. And the awesome thing is, is that I was trying to make more room for our goggles because they were getting squished in that little drawer over there. And the drawer next to it had a whole bunch of slides. I found some flagella slides. Um, I just haven't cleaned them up or looked at them yet. Um, but maybe next week we'll even ha be able to see um, where they've stained it, right? These are where they've stained it and made the flagella thicker so you can see it under the light microscope. These are scanning probably electron micrograph pictures, um, which is why you can see the little tiny flagella. So this is the, uh, for wet mount or hang drop, wet mount would be, of course, just... Um, a liquid, right, whether it be the broth or water um, and your bacteria added to it and cover slipped. Um, this one you run into some problems with, like I said, so I don't like that one so much. This is a little bit more difficult doing the hang drop like I did, um, but I, I always find you, you get the best results um, with that one. They'll be alive for at least a while <laughs> because they're unstained. They're not going to stay alive forever. So what are some complications that we run into, and how does this affect our results? So if we have a known modal organism, like I knew this one was modal, right? I knew it was supposed to move, right? Um, if I over-inoculated them on the slide, can the organisms move under these conditions? So if they're crowded, right, are they going to move? Not as well as we would like to. It would be really difficult to see that, right? Imagine yourself in a crowded room, right? And, and I said, let's do the Macarena. You would just be like, oh, forget about it, right? I don't want to hit the person next to me. So, yeah, this would create a problem, right? So if you have, in this case, right, we know it's modal, right? For instance, your motility tube looked modal. And then we put too many on the slide. We put it under the microscope and you say, oh, they're not moving. What type of result would this be? This would be what we call a false negative result, right? Where it looks negative, right? But that's not accurate. This is a modal organism. It should be moving. Will this condition make organisms appear to move? So if it's a non-modal organism... If we crowd them in, is this going to make them move? No, right? So will this have any effect on our results? No. So if it was a non-modal, it wasn't going to move anyways, right? So this doesn't really affect. What you really have to worry about with over-inoculation is if you have a modal organism, right? You're going to impede them from moving and probably record the wrong result, a false negative result. I got a cool video of this. Um, sometimes when when this happens, they'll still move. And there's a really cool video that I think um, Peter found of it still kind of moving, but its motility is limited because it's stuck to the slide. Um, but if it's a modal organism, right, and it's like clear on stuck to the slide, is it going to move? No, 
So then you're going to end up with another what? False negative result. If it's a non-modal organism, is being stuck to the slide going to cause them to move? No. So would this have any effect on our results for a non-modal? No. We just have to worry about this problem with modal organisms, right? We don't want to crowd them in, and we certainly don't want them sticking to the slide, although I have to tell you I have no idea how to stop them from doing that. <laughs> the good news is probably you have enough organisms that if some stick, others have not stuck to the slide. This next problem happens more often with um, a wet mount which is one of the main reasons why I don't like to do wet mounts. Um, it's re referred to as a receding water line. What happens is the water is moving, right, and not the organisms. How you spot this is that all of the stuff will be moving very fast in the same direction. So imagine a log floating down a river, right? All the logs, right, are going in the same direction. They're all going together. So under the microscope, if you have a receding water line, you'll notice they're all moving in the same direction, right? And actually much faster than bacteria normally move. Although well, these guys can move pretty darn fast, right? Does that make sense to you guys? So if we have a modal organism, is this going to be a problem for us? If you look in and you see them moving? No, you're like, oh, okay, it's modal. The problem is, is if it's a non-modal, is this going to cause them to look like they're modal? Yeah, all of a sudden you see movement. You're like, oh, you don't recognize that they're all moving in the same direction really fast. Right? So this would give you a false what? Positive. Right? This is the one condition you have to work at. Watch out for your non-modals. Right? They could look like they're moving. Using an old culture. Are most of the organisms going to be alive or dead? They're mostly going to be dead. Is this going to affect motility? Yeah, if they're all dead, are they going to move? No. Usually we don't move after we're dead. You know, unless we're talking about the walking dead. <laughs> Bacteria don't do that, right? So most likely we're going to end up with a false negative result. That's why, too, that I said that this is a fresh culture of this organism. And there's a reason why I said that. Will this condition make the organisms appear to be moving? So again, they're not walking dead bacteria, right? So if they're dead, they're not going to move, right? If they're non-modal, they were never going to move to begin with. So this has no effect. So as I said, we for there's lots of conditions for our modals that we have to look out for, right? We don't want to overcrowd them. We don't want them to stick. And we don't want to use an old culture where most of them are dead. Somebody out there, ah, oh, Naomi, yay. Um, and we don't want... Um, for our non-modals, we don't want this receding waterline condition. And as I said, this happens more often with the wet mount than with the hang drop. Which is why I prefer the hang drop. So I've got a bunch of videos, right? And I've got a bunch that I posted for you guys too that are really cool to watch the motility and stuff like that. And you guys have seen the real thing. And some of these are videos are stuff that I took in my class, right? Um, But you guys have seen the seen it for real today. One of my new favorites. So what's brownie in motion though? Is this motility? Now it's another problem we have to worry about sometimes when we're viewing them under the microscope. Because being in a liquid matrix, there's always bombardment of water molecules against each other. When that happens, they could bump into the bacteria. And it almost causes this vibration that you'll see, right? So this is the random vibration of molecules due to thermal energy, right? So this random collision that happens. And thermal energy, we're talking about what? What are we talking? Heat, right? Thermal is heat. 
So why didn't we stain the organism before viewing them under the microscope for this motility test? Yeah, staining does what? It kills them. So what did we say about dead bacteria? Do they move? No, they're not walking dead bacteria. They won't move. So we can't stain them. We will kill them. We won't see them move. That would be bad news. Although it would help us with contrast, right? We kind of need them to still move. So you are, you are told that viewing is best done with as little il illumination as possible, right? Um, why will transparent cells be easier to view with less light? It's kind of a tricky one, right? There's a really high-tech scientific answer to this one, right? Um, something referred to as spherical aberration. Uh, but my best example of this is what does a little kid do when, they, when you hand them a flashlight? They shine it right in your eyes, don't they? And you can't see a darn thing, right? Because you've got all this light flooding in, right? And you, and you can't distinguish. So same thing for some of you guys, right? Um, when we look under the microscope, you're like, it's like blinding you, right? And you turn down the light intensity. Um, when you do that, right, so if we're dealing with really bright, right, so say that's a brightness of, of, of 50 pennies, and, and your unstained specimen isn't absorbing any of that light, maybe a penny's worth, you're dealing with all of this light, equivalent of 49 pennies, blaring at you. Are you going to be able to see the subtle difference between 1 and, and 49? No. But if you dim the background, where the background light intensity is, say, around 5, then seeing that difference of now about a penny's worth of light being absorbed by your organism, then you only have that contrast of about 4 pennies. So the other thing that helps us in the real world that you've probably experienced is in your room at night. Right? If you have a night light or some other type of lighting, like my alarm clock, right? I wish I could turn off the light that's associated with that. Right? This ambient light that you'll have in your room. And so then you, you see shadows, right? Where if the room is pitch dark, you're not going to see anything. Right? But just a little bit of light, you are able to visualize things, right? You just need a small amount of light and you can see those subtle differences. Does that make sense to you guys? Right? So think about that blinding light. We've got to decrease the amount of light so that that very subtle difference can be visualized under dim light conditions. So why would you expect brownie motion to increase the longer you observe a hang drop preparation or wet mount? So what's the problem? What's, what's brownie in motion? The vibration due to what? Thermal energy, which is basically heat. So think about our microscopes. Is there anything that heats up on our microscopes? The light, yeah. And unfortunately, the older microscopes that I prefer have halogen light bulbs, which get hot. LEDs, on the other hand, do not. The newer microscopes actually have LEDs, except the newer microscopes have other issues that drive me crazy. So it's not worth it, right? But that light, right, um, puts out quite a bit of heat. So over time, right, that's going to um, be transferred to the slide and increase that vibration that can happen. So our motility test. Is the media used for this test what we refer to as being solid? No, right? So if you guys were to squish it, right, in fact, maybe I'll even let you guys do that, you could feel that it isn't as hard as what we pour into our plates or even our slants. Why is that? Why would we want the, it to be completely solid? Right, so if our bacteria, right, if we put them in and the media is solid, it's basically going to hold them there, right? They're not going to be able to move. We need to be what's referred to as semi-solid. Just a little bit of agar to create some, some 
stability, but enough space between the agar molecules so that the bacteria can spread out, right? So we can see that they're spreading. So we want to allow movement. So this is before we started using the reagent TTC that's in the motility media and it as actually what's causing our tubes to be a little bit pink. You can see this is a negative stab. You can clearly see the bacteria stayed where you put it, right? Can you see the bacteria in this one? But do you notice something different between the media here and the media here? It's cloudy, right? But that would be really hard to see, right? It would make it definitely questionable. So we don't want to be questionable, right? What does a positive result look like? What did we see? We saw them radiating out and spreading. So when you have TTC, it reacts with the growing bacteria and it turns red. So you can very clearly see the bacteria stayed where it was put here, right, for this negative stab. But here you can see the spreading out, right, that it's positive. So the oxidized soluble form of TTC is colorless. So our media, right, should be clear, but unfortunately we're having um, some reduction that's happening, right? Paula is going cuckoo bananas over that. But it isn't enough that it's stopped us from being able to really have the benefit of the TTC. In its insoluble form, what color is it turning? Red, right? So you notice the red growth. And the reason why we use it, again, is to help us visualize where the growth is in that tube. That's why we use this reagent. So when the organisms grow, they reduce this reagent and turn it red. So why is it important to carefully insert and remove the needle along the same stab line? So... Lashante did this, and in your guys' racks, the question mark with the pink label is a bad stab for one reason or another. And then green is also a, uh, a spread that's not uniform, so it's non-modal. Your yellow labeled tubes, there's not enough bacteria in there really to tell right, um, whether it's modal or non-modal. You don't have enough growth. So if you do like you see here, right, this one, you see how it's kind of spread out, but it's in a flat plane. This one, they came in and came back out, so they spread it, right, along this one plane in the tube. But when you turn the tube, right, this is why you look at your tube, you know, um, two sides. Oh, I don't have the other side. This would be flat. It would, it would look straight. Here's another one where, again, they kind of went in and came back out. So you can tell this is when they inoculated it, they spread the organisms. This is not the organisms being modal and spreading on their own. So not doing a good stab, if you don't know, right, and you don't recognize that you spread it as you inoculated, you may think this is what? You might think it's positive, you might think it's modal. And this would be a false positive result, right? So growth will occur anywhere that the inoculating needle contacts the media. Since spreading from the stab line indicates motility, poor stabbing technique will result in growth in many parts of your media and perhaps give the impression of motility, right? But you've got to really know what you're looking for. Uh, if you have a nice single stab line, it's much easier to interpret, right? What are some possible ways you might get a false positive? So we already said that, right? Yeah, you spread it as you put it in, a bad stab. What about negative results? I can't remember which one I go over first. Well, positive we just did. 
And, and remember, it mean, false positive means the organism is actually non-modal, but it looks positive, right? And again, this has to do with how you perform the test, right? You want a nice, good stab line. That's perfect. This one is actually not the person's fault. One, two of the organisms we deal with kind of spreads in between the spaces of the media as you inoculate it. I have no earthly idea why it does that. But again, it's not uniform, right? Do you see how that that's, you know, an artifact of where it got, where it went when we inoculated? So poor stabbing technique and misinterpretation. So enterococcus fascialis, sometimes we have a problem with that, and Klebsiella pneumonia. But again, it's going to be a flat spread. It's not going to be three-dimensional. What about false negative, though? What if you have a modal organism? So in the case of the one that I did, right? And it looks negative for that stab. It's a perfect straight line stab, right? I have in that rack for that exact same organism. But we looked under the microscope. We saw it moving for sure. Yeah, one for that one, it's probably too big, right? It can't move enough through the media that you really see it. What else would stop it from moving through the media? If it was dead, right, you didn't have a nice live culture to start with. And the media itself, if it wasn't made right, right? So if you have a modal organism, but yet it looks non-modal, what could have happened to prevent motility? So what's the problem here? Looks negative, right? But the organ is actually a model organism. What's the problem with that picture? Not enough bacteria. Probably not enough live bacteria, right, were inoculated. So you didn't get enough growth to get the spread. You see how it's very thin line, right? And your guys have been growing for, oh gosh, two weeks now, right? Your cultures? No, one week, because you guys actually had lab last week. Um, significantly enough that, you know, even if you had just a little bit of bacteria, enough has grown that you see a nice good spread. Um, but if you didn't even put enough in there to begin with, then, or they weren't alive. There's one person, I guess not this class, there's nothing to see, right? Something went wrong. <laughs> There's literally nothing in the tube. So we need to, right, make sure we have enough live. We need to make sure that the media is not too solid. Um, we also are not going to use old media because it's going to dry out and therefore become too solid over time. Why is it essential that the reduced TTC be insoluble? So remember, when it's insoluble, it turns red. It's going to help us see where it is. But what, what does soluble or insoluble mean? First of all, right? If you don't even know what that means, you can't answer this question, can you? Right? What's soluble mean? Or insoluble? So how many of you guys like sweet tea? I love sweet tea, right? But some restaurants you go to, right, and they only have regular tea. I go, okay, I'll pass. Right? Why Why am I saying that? Because you try to add the sugar when the tea is cold, right? It doesn't dissolve very well, right? It all ends up in the bottom of the glass, okay? Right? The solubility of the sugar really happens better when it's heated, right? When you actually melt, use heat to help separate those sugar molecules, right? And get them into solution, right? So soluble means in solution, right? Some things are more soluble than others. This reagent is soluble, which means that when we first put it, when she puts it in the media, our lab prep person, where is it in that tube if it's soluble? Everywhere in the tube, right? Everywhere in that tube. And we want it everywhere in that tube, right? So that when we inoculate it with the bacteria, wherever the bacteria land, they're going to come in contact with the TTC, correct? But when the bacteria grow, they're going to reduce that reagent and turn it red and also make it insoluble. Does that, what does that mean? 
If it's insoluble, it's going to what? It's going to come out of solution, and which means it's going to stay where the bacteria are. Right? It's going to stay with the bacteria. And that's important because if we turned it red and it was still soluble, it could leave the bacteria, right? And diffuse throughout the entire tube. We don't want that. We're using it as an indicator to help us see growth. So it's got to stay where the bacteria are. It needs to be insoluble when it's reduced and turned to the red color. Does that make sense to you guys? We need, insoluble means it's going to stay put. Okay, so scientific method, right? How, why do we do this? How do we do this? What are the outcomes? What are our results? What does this all mean, right? That brings us to our fluid. Flu, ah, I'm just going to say FTM. <laughs> say fluid today. Thioglycolate media. There we go. An anaerobic jar. Both of these, right, the whole premise behind this is determining anaerobic growth. Right? Our question for your guys unknowns today is can it grow anaerobically? So both tests determine the oxygen requirements of a bacterial organism. And when we say oxygen, we're referring to oxygen gas, which is usually uh, di diatomic oxygen, right? Two oxygens together written O2. Why is oxygen important? Who cares? What's the big deal about oxygen? We need it to survive. Why do we need it to survive? Because we're what are called aerobes, right? So why do we need it? What at the metabolic level, why are we using this? Something called aerobic respiration. Oh, you're starting to remember, right? This is something you're supposed to cover in biology class, by the way. It's supposed to be review, right? Plays a role in how some organisms obtain energy for growth. Not all, right? Some organisms can grow, as I said, anaerobically without oxygen. So the next few slides are a review of metabolism, right? With and without oxygen. And we're going to be dealing a lot with um, metabolism and fermentation in the next couple of tests that you guys are going to be reading about for homework and that we're going to be looking at for your unknown organisms. So catabolism, I always remember a cat, right? I had a cat that completely destroyed the uh, my dad's recliner when I was a kid. I got in trouble for that. Um, but they like to tear things up, right? So whenever I say catabolism, I always think about breaking things apart, right? Tearing stuff up. So, catabolism is the breakdown of large organic molecules. So, breaking down sugars, right? To release the energy in the bonds between those atoms that form that sugar molecule. Although proteins and lipids can be a source of energy, right? Mostly we deal with sugars, carbohydrates, right? Are a prime source of energy for most organisms, right? So, we'll be talking about, you know, can it eat this sugar, right? We're going to be asking that. Um, next week and the following week about your unknown. Can it eat glucose? Can it ferment glucose? So there are three aspects or pathways of energy production for carbohydrates, right? Such as six carbon sugars um, like glucose. Anyone remember? What's the first step of breaking down glucose? We do this in our cells. It's, it's breaking glucose. So it's, it's lysing glucose What's the general name for that process? Glycolysis, right? And then we go into what cycle? The citric acid or the TCA or the Krebs cycle, right? And then what else do we need? Because we're going to release a whole bunch of electrons that electron carriers are going to grab. Now, someone said it, ETC, electron transport chain. And that's where it's important for oxygen. Because who is going to grab those electrons? For aerobic respiration, it's oxygen. It is our final electron acceptor. 
Wow. All right, so glycolysis, breaking down glucose into the different parts that then go into the Krebs cycle or TCA or sometimes called the citric acid cycle, right? And then those electrons go to the electron transport chain. So organisms trap some of the energy in the form of GTP or ATP, right? These are modified nucleotides um, that have three um, phosphates. That's the T, stands for tri, right? P for phosphate. G is uh, guanosine and ad adenosine, right? These are nucleotides, right? What make up your DNA and RNA. But that's a, that's a high energy bond between those phosphate groups. And you've got three of them, even. And so adding that phosphate, right, to form these molecules, you're storing that energy, right? It's the currency of most of uh, the reactions in our cells. Glycolysis produces only a small amount of ATP. Right at the substrate level, means right at the enzymatic reaction level, we're producing a little bit of straight up ATP. Most of the ATP we produced is from the electron carriers that grab the electrons from the, Krebs, from the Krebs cycle for the most part and a little bit from glycolysis. This is called oxidative phosphorylation because electrons are be moving. This is the oxidative that refers to the loss of electrons, right? Electrons are being taken from our sugar and we're giving them to the electron transport chain, right? Anybody remember oil rig? Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons, right? So that's a little mnemonic that people use to remember that, what we mean when we say oxidation versus reduction. And typically, when something loses electrons, something else gains them, right? So we are always usually dealing with what's called redox reactions. It's not me. It's somebody in the closet. Oil rig. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Reduction is the gain of electrons. That'll save you in chemistry class, right? There's another saying out there, but that one I always never forget. Yeah, oil rig, especially living in Louisiana, you can't forget that, right? <laughs> so here we're talking about electrons, right, in the process of phosphorylating, adding the phosphates, right, to ADP to form ATP. So some organisms don't have the ability to use the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain. They rely strictly on glycolysis and are called fermenters. So they just do glycolysis. Can't do the Krebs cycle, right? They have no place for the electrons to go to the electron transport chain. So they have this whole electron problem, though, because they still are going to take electrons in glycolysis. But they've got to put these somewhere. So they usually add it back to the breakdown products. And we form very common byproducts, such as alcohols, which are some of our favorite, right? Um, gases, not so favorite. But, you know, when you want bread to rise, that good old carbon dioxide produced by fermentation is kind of a good thing, right? And then acids, um, which a lot of fermented foods, right, that's why they're sour, is because of the acid production, right? Lots of different acids. So organisms that use all three pathways to catabolize sugar are, are said to respire, right? In other words, they generate energy through respiration. It can be divided into two types. One that uses oxygen as the final electron acceptor, and one that does not use electron is the final electron center. Of course, we are the aerobic kind. We use oxygen as our final electron acceptor, and we form metabolic water. Every time we break down glucose, aerobically anyways. 
Other organisms out there can do what's called anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic basically means without oxygen. But they're still respiring, they're still adding electrons, but they're adding it to some other molecule other than oxygen. So it depends on the organism, right? Some of them will take sulfate and um, reduce it into other forms like sulfite or hydrogen sulfide. Others can take nitrate and turn it into nitrite and then into ammonia. Others can keep going all the way to generating nitrogen gas. And these anaerobic fermentations are the ones we're usually sometimes not so fond of because some of these byproducts are really kind of smelly, right? So those sulfur oxidizing bacteria are what give rotten eggs that awful smell, right? That sulfur smell, right? And if you live outside of the parish, right? Um, sometimes in Ponchatoula, when I lived there, the water would smell kind of rotten, eggy, and it was the sulfur content in that water um, there. So some well water, right, swamps, right, we experience this a lot because of the, the organisms that grow in these environments, right? Uh, Denutrifying bacteria and, and stuff like that um, deep in the soil, and, and they contribute to stagnant water problems as well. So... Anaerobic um, respiration is really important and how we actually treat our sewage, right? So we use this in the, in the process of um, uh, treating sewage. And so this is an interesting um, environmental example that um, Peter put together for us. I'm going to leave it for you guys to go ahead and read through, uh, but it's kind of cool. My favorite one is the gut of the ruminant, right? So cows especially, um, but horses to a certain extent as well, um, have the ability to digest plant matter. Um, so they eat grass, right, and they break down cellulose. But they don't actually do it. Guess who does it in their gut for them? Bacteria, right? And so this really large um, stomach, they, they're said to have four stomachs. This one is referred to as the rumen. Um, and this is where anaerobic fermentation happens, where they're breaking down um, those um, sources. And then the uh, rectilium is basically a filter. And then the omasum is um, sucking the water back out. And then in the abomasin, they're basically digesting and eating the bacteria now. Right? So they're growing bacteria and eating bacteria. This is why, too, as a veterinarian, right, when you want to give antibiotics to somebody's cow, they usually will freak out. Why? If you kill the bacteria, you will kill the cow. Okay? If you kill off, right, their bacterial communities in their rumen, you will kill the cow. So, good old anaerobic fermentation. So, if organisms are grown on media that contain sugars but lack compounds necessary for anaerobic respiration, then they have two options. They can grow well via aerobic respiration with oxygen if they have that ability, or they can grow poorly because they're not going to generate as much energy via fermentation and you don't need oxygen for fermentation. So it's without oxygen. In reality, not all organisms, right? have the ability to me metabolize in different ways, right? Um, we can do anaerobic fermentation, right, in our muscles. It's not good for us to do that long term because the acid byproducts are toxic, uh, right? When you get the lactic acid buildup, right, from breaking down of glucose, um, we can't sustain ourselves. It becomes too toxic, right? We're stuck being aerobic respiration. If there's no oxygen, right, we will die. But other organisms have evolved that they do have multiple ways they can respire. So life on this planet probably started out without oxygen. But photosynthetic organisms produced excess oxygen. Others evolved and could utilize oxygen and could actually grow even faster with oxygen than without it. And then you had these organisms that um, adapted to the presence of oxygen but didn't utilize it. We, there we call those aerotolerant. And then others still stayed anaerobic, where oxygen is actually toxic to them. 
They cannot grow in the presence of it. So, important terms for us as it applies to this class is aerotolerance. So, oxygen can be toxic. And we're going to learn about next time one of the protective enzymes, catalase, that we have as well to protect us from toxic forms of oxygen. So, tolerance is, right, can, is it ability or are they unable to grow in the presence of oxygen, right? Are they aerotolerant or intolerant? Strict or obligate, those two terms are used interchangeably. And strict means absolutely have to, right? Obligate, you're obligated to, you've got to do it. So an aerobe, right, requires what to survive? Can't survive without it. It's got to have oxygen. And that's what we are, right? So we strictly do aerobic respiration. What about a strict or obligate anaerobe? This means, right, they're growing what? Without oxygen. They can't actually even grow in the presence of it. Oxygen is toxic for them. Right? So strict meaning they only can grow anaerobically. They can either grow with anaerobic, using utilizing anaerobic respiration or fermentation, because fermentation does not require oxygen. But the important thing is, is they can't grow in the presence of oxygen and kill them. Microaerophiles. So micro means what? Small. So, do they need oxygen? Yes, but small amounts of oxygen. So again, remember, oxygen can be toxic. So, they can't handle a lot of it, just a little bit. Just enough to basically grow. Because they are using aerobic respiration. Otherwise, what's the point of having oxygen at all, right? Note, a capnophile is a microaerophile that requires, in addition to small amounts of oxygen, elevated levels of carbon dioxide. Where for us, right, increased carbon dioxide would be really bad news. Facultative anaerobes. So facultative, anyone know what that means? The ability to change. So anaerobe implies, can they grow anaerobically? Sure. Facultative means they can change, right? So these guys can do both. They're organisms that can grow best in the presence of oxygen. They actually prefer oxygen. They'll do aerobic respiration with oxygen. But without oxygen, they can do anaerobic respiration or fermentation depending on the organism. So this is great, right? Doesn't matter whether you've got it or not, I'm still going to live, right? You're not going to get rid of me over oxygen. I'm going to keep going. Aerotolerant anaerobes. So aerotolerant implies, is oxygen going to hurt them? No. But how do they actually respire? Do they use oxygen? No, they can tolerate it, but they don't use it. They're anaerobes, right? So they're, they're going to grow usually by fermentation. But they'll ferment even though oxygen is present. They don't use it, but they're not killed by it, unlike your strict anaerobes. They have protection. So you know me, right? I love tables. If you have my lecture class, you know this about me. All right, so let's summarize right, some important points here. So does it require oxygen for metabolism? Can it grow in the presence of oxygen? This is all about can it protect itself from toxic forms of oxygen, right? And can it grow without oxygen, right? Does it have this additional ability to either anaerobic respiration or fermentation? So strict 
are obligate aerobes. Do they require oxygen for their metabolism? Yeah, they'll die without it. Obligate anaerobes. Do they require it? No. Microaerophiles. Yes, but remember, small amounts. Facultative anaerobes, do they require it for their metabolism? Do they have to have it? No. They can use it, remember. They don't have to have it. Aerotolerant anaerobes, do they require oxygen? No. Notice their name, right? Whenever we see anaerobe, it's always no oxygen requirement. Okay. Can they grow in the presence of oxygen? Well, aerobes, you better, right? Otherwise, you're dead. Strict anaerobes, can they grow in the presence of oxygen? No. That's the problem for them, right? It is lethal. Microaerophiles, can they grow in the presence of oxygen? Yes, but it's got to be small amounts. Facultative anaerobes, can they grow in the presence of oxygen? Yes, they'll grow actually quite abundantly. Aerotolerant anaerobes, can they grow in the presence of oxygen? Yes. So the only one who has a mere, major issue with oxygen is who? Your strict anaerobes, right? They have no protection. It will kill them. Can these organisms grow without or without oxygen? So if you're a strict aerobe, can you grow without oxygen? No. If you're an anaerobe, this is the only way you're going to grow, right? So the, definitely a yes. Microaerophiles, can they grow without oxygen? Without it at all? They need some. So the answer here is no. They can't grow without it, right? They've got to have some. Facultative anaerobes, can they grow without oxygen? Yes, anaerobic means without oxygen, right? So they will grow as well, right? But they can do it. What about aerotolerant anaerobes? Yes, right? So again, they can tolerate oxygen, but they're growing anaerobically without oxygen. Okay, so this brings us to our fluothioglycolate medium. So you'll notice, right, and in your guys' racks, remember these are the ones we don't want to shake up too much, um, the FTM tube, there's an uninoculated control with a pink layer. I want you guys to find that one in your rack right now. Right. So remember, grab it by the tube, not the cap. Right, do you guys see that pink layer? So this is how our tube started out, right? Should say, yep, alaric has got it. Do you guys got it in the back? The uninoculated FTM tube. Should have a pink ring. That's a pretty thick layer of pink, right? This wouldn't necessarily be ideal to inoculate. We're going to talk about why. The, this media is from yesterday. So... Why, there's actually, and if you were to stick and you guys already inoculated these tubes, remember there was a little bit of resistance and you could kind of see where you put your bacteria in this tube. Why do we have a little bit of auger in this tube? What, what is the purpose of the auger serve? It's going to stop the diffusion of what gas into this media? Oxygen. <coughs> or slow it down. Not stop it, but it's going to slow it down. Because what type of environment do we want in the bottom of this tube? We want an anaerobic environment without oxygen. It also helps us stabilize the growth. So again, why we don't want to shake up our tubes, right? So we can see the growth pattern. So why does the sodium thio, what does the sodium thioglycolate and L uh, cytosine in the media do? So these tubes are not sealed, right? What's going to get into these tubes? Oxygen, right? And so what happens is these reagents are going to convert oxygen into water, right? So that we can create that anaerobic environment, right? So it reduces the free oxygen, right? Gains electrons and forms water. So those are the two ways, right, that we're creating an anaerobic environment in the bottom of our tube. 
We're reducing it with the thioglycolate, and we're slowing the movement of oxygen into the tube by having auger there. What color is resorin in the presence of oxygen? Pink, right? So we have an indicator in here right, that we just saw, right, that makes the media where there's a high concentration of oxygen pink. Is it oxidized or reduced in the presence of oxygen? So does it lose electrons or gain electrons? What do you guys think? It loses electrons. It becomes oxidized. This reagent. So why do we need this reagent? Who cares? There's oxygen in the tube. We'll be able to see how much oxygen is in the tube if we didn't have this indicator. No, I don't know about you, but I cannot see molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. Can you? No, we need help, right? We need an indicator. We can't see these things, right? We need something to help us see. Now, of course, there's a gradient that forms in the tube, right? This is where the greatest concentration of oxygen is, is where it's pink. And then it diffuses down, right? And hopefully by the bottom of the tube, we've definitely got a pretty anaerobic environment. All right, so it's, it actually is a gradient. So there is oxygen here right underneath the pink layer, right? It's just the greatest amount is in the pink layer. Does that make sense to you guys? And then hopefully when we get way down here, there's no oxygen. So why is there... A colored band, well, we already said, right, this is the resorin. This is help us indicate that there's oxygen. Why is it more desirable for, for, which is more desirable, a thick or thin colored band near the top of the media? Thin, right? We just want a small amount of oxygen because, remember, it diffuses past this pink layer, and if it goes too far, what are we not going to have at the bottom? We're not going to have an anaerobic, right? So I had to set up that media, especially for you guys, um, for that lab day. And I think we had kind of a thick layer because, again, I made them the day before. Uh, but I've got some in the refrigerator. They're completely pink. Would we use those? No, because there's no anaerobic thing. So what we do is we boil them for five minutes to drive all the oxygen out, and then we cool them down and let the oxygen slowly come back in before we inoculate um, the media, which is a bit of a pain in the butt, but, you know, we do it for you guys. All right, we already answered that. So, based on the growth patterns, if the media is set up correctly, right, we can determine what your organism is, right? Is it an obligate aerobe, right? Is it an anaerobe? But again, the question you guys are asking in your lab report is, can it grow anaerobically, right? Do we see growth in the bottom of our tubes, right? Yes or no, positive or negative for growth there. So if you have, and a few of you guys do, and this is why I had to refrigerate them, because again, the oxygen's going to keep diffusing, so the growth would keep going down the tube, right? And we wanted to make sure that you could see it's just at the top of your tube, that yours is not growing anaerobically. So there's a few of you guys, when I hand you your tube, right, I'm going to say, look, you're just at the top, <laughs> right? Or as best at the top as I could keep it there. So who is going to be like that? Our obligate aerobes, right? Because they cannot grow without oxygen. So they got to stay at the top of the tube where the oxygen is, right? So that's tube number one is our obligate aerobes, right? Where are our microaerophiles going to grow? Which tube number? They need oxygen, right? Yeah, so towards the top. So which one is also towards the top? Four, right? But remember, they can't grow anaerobically, so notice no growth down here. Your obligate anaerobes, remember, can only grow without oxygen. So where is growth only happening without oxygen? at the bottom. So number two. Your aerotolerant anaerobes means they can tolerate oxygen, right? But are they using it? No. So are they are they going to be affected by oxygen? No. So which tube are they going to be? Three or five? How many say five? Okay. You're right. 
So what's the difference between 3 and 5, though? It's uniform for 5, right? Because they're not affected by the oxygen, and they're not using it. Unlike 3, which is definitely by process of elimination here, right? Our facultative anaerobe. And what do we see here? More growth at the top. Why? Yeah, it can grow better with oxygen. So, do you guys think any of you guys have an anaerobe? A strict anaerobe where it's only going to be at the bottom? I don't know about you, but there's usually oxygen in this lab, right? Otherwise, we'd be passing out and dying. So, can we maintain an oxygen-free environment to grow any anaerobes? No. It's like the impossible mission. So, we don't have this example right, in my rack, and you don't have these types of organisms. Microaerophiles, too, are really hard to keep happy, right, because we've got to decrease the amount of concentration. So we've got three choices here, y'all. You may have an obligate aerobe, right, which it's not going to grow anaerobically, right, it's only going to be at the top of the tube. Or you have a facultative, which most of you guys are going to have. There's actually one organism that's aero tolerant. And so what I want you guys to do right now is carefully, right, pick up the tubes in your rack and see if you can figure out which is which. So our choices are aerobic, right, facultative, and aero tolerant. So talk with your lab mates, see if you can figure out what's what. Andrew, I got my answers on my rack up front. All right, do so we got it figured out? All right, what's A? Obligate what? Aerobe, right? It's only growing at the top. Do you all see that? Granted, it's creeping down the tube as the oxygen is. I think I even put a line on that one. But hopefully the very bottom of that tube, there's no growth, right? Now, what about your other tubes? They look pretty much the same, right? So which one do you think is the facultative anaerobe? What one? B, what do you guys think? B, what do you guys think of the back table, Alarica? Which one is the facultative anaerobe? Now, what's going to distinguish that one from the aerotolerant? There should be hopefully a little bit more growth at the top of the tube. What do you guys think? Grace and y'all, what do you think? Which one's the facultative, A or B? It's actually B, right? But again, really hard to tell, right? So I'll tell you guys, right, there's going to be one other test that's going to help you clue in whether yours is facultative or the one arrow tolerant that we have, right? One person gets the prize, right? So, but today you're just recording where the growth is in your tube, right? You're going to draw on your unknown report, and you're going to indicate whether it grew anaerobically or not, right? We're not going to figure out if it's a facultative anaerobe yet or arrow tolerant. We can't determine that until we do the catalase test. Okay. So here's some really perfect pictures from your book, right? So um, which one is your strict aerobe in this picture? A, B, C, or C, or D, or E? D, right? Just at the top, right? And some of you guys are going to have that. Which one's your strict anaerobe? E? Where do you see growth in E? It's actually a little bit right there. Yeah, a little bit towards the top. Yeah, there's a little bit of a pink layer, and then right below the pink is a little bit of growth. So growth without oxygen is seen where in the tube? Anywhere there isn't oxygen. So see, that's oxygen, right? It's pink. You see where the growth is, right? the non-oxygen zone. So that's your strict anaerobe. That's your C, which we don't have, right? Your microaerophile, therefore, would be your 
the E, where it's just below, right, the oxygen layer, the, the highest concentration of oxygen, right? Where's your facultative anaerobe? And this is picture perfect. A or B, right? Which one is your facultative anaerobe? B, B, because what? We've got a lot of growth in the oxygen layer and not as much, right, in the non-oxygen layer. So it's B. So by default, uniform growth throughout is our aerotolerant anaerobe. Okay. Why is it important that the media be fresh? Right? We don't want too much oxygen in the tube because what type of organism are we trying to grow? Anaerobes, right? We want to know can they grow anaerobically. So which type of organism would most likely be affected negatively if we use old media? Anyone who has what in the name? Anaerobe, right? Anaerobes, right? The whole point of this media is anaerobes, right? So obligate anaerobes would not be happy. Facultative anaerobes would be okay, right? Because they can do the whole oxygen thing, right? And aerotolerance can tolerate. It would be our obligate anaerobes, right, that would be most dis disturbed. Which ones would wouldn't be affected, right? Basically all of them except the anaerobes, the strict anaerobes, right? So the older, the more oxygen, right? It's not what we want. We want to create an anaerobic environment. All right. So that brings us to our anaerobic jar. So again, can you see if an environment is aerobic or not? So the indicator strip that's typically used, or the indicator that's typically used in anaerobic jar is methylene blue. What color is methylene blue? Color is methylene blue? Blue. But in an anaerobic environment, it will be colorless. <laughs> well, clearly our room is aerobic because when we used the dye, it was blue, right? So... In aerobic environment, it is blue. Right? We've used it. We've dyed with it. It's an aerobic environment. It's blue. But when you stick it in here and you suck the oxygen out, it will become colorless. Right? So you'll see the little gas pack that I have in here. The tablet is getting really old, but it is still somewhat blue. Right? Because this is not anaerobic. Here is when I set up one. Do you see how that little tablet is white? That means that environment inside that jar is anaerobic at that moment. Okay? If it turns blue, that's bad news, right? Because the whole purpose of this jar is to create what type of environment? Anaerob that's why it's called an anaerobic jar. So, colorless, anaerobic. This one that was left out, Notice it turned blue, right? That's because in this room, it's definitely oxygen, right? Hydrogen gas molecules from the reaction catalyzed in the gas gener generator envelope. So these little envelopes come wrapped in foil. I might actually have one. The little indicator strip. Right? Because that's what So I've got them, I just don't have enough jars to seal up, right? So they come wrapped in foil, right? We would open these up, right? you got to put three per this size jar. We would stick our cultures in, and then we would seal it tight. And a reaction will start happening, right, once this packet is in this chamber, out of the foil. It produces two gases, hydrogen and carbon dioxide gas. What happens to the oxygen? It combines with one of those gases to form a particular molecule. It, it combines with the hydrogen gas. So hydrogen and oxygen gas makes water. Similar to what we did in the thioglycolate tubes, right? 
we converted oxygen into water. So what do you see there? Water! Condensation! Do the formation of water. Alright, so we know it's working. So if an anaerobic environment is inside the jar, how will this affect the growth of the different organisms? So if we actually achieve an anaerobic environment, will our anaerobes grow? Yeah, they're going to be like, score, we're home, right? They'll grow and they'll grow abundantly. If we stick an aerobe in here, we're going to kill it, right? If we stick a facultative anaerobe in here, what's going to happen to its growth? Yeah, it'll grow, but not as much, right? Because it, it grows faster with oxygen, but it can still grow under anaerobic conditions. So, you know, we could put your organism, streak it on a plate, stick it in here, right? Suck the oxygen out and see if it survives or not. If the environment is aerobic inside the jar, right, so we spring a leak, right, our indicator tablet turns blue, but maybe we didn't put one in with an indicator tablet, somebody forgot, right, or was defective. If we know that we put an anaerobe in there and it didn't grow, we know we probably sprung a leak, right, because our anaerobes would die underneath aerobic conditions. What about our aerobes? They should do what in an aerobic jar? In an anaerobic jar, our aerobes should be killed, right? But if it springs a leak, they're going to what? Grow. Are our facultatives going to help us out? They'll grow and they'll grow more, but I mean, how can you tell between more or less? Right? Depends on whether you put a set number of bacteria in there. But if you could recognize the difference, you would notice that they grew a lot more than they should have. So for the experiment, we would put plates outside the jar in an aerobic environment and plates inside the jar in an anaerobic environment. What is the environment inside the jar if our tablet is colorless? It's anaerobic. Is oxygen present? No. What's our environment outside the jar? Right? It's aerobic. Is there oxygen? Yeah, otherwise we'd all be passing out. Okay, so these are some results. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, no growth inside the jar, only growth outside the jar. So what would we classify this organism as? Aerobic, right? Strict aerobic. Clostridium sporogenes grows inside the jar and no growth outside. This is our anaerobe, right? Because it grew under only anaerobic conditions. Staphylococcus aureus grew in the anaerobic jar and grew more outside of the jar. This is your facultative anaerobe. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we just classified as an aerobe, right? Does this organism require oxygen for growth? Yes, because what happened to it under anaerobic conditions? It died, right? So it will, oxygen will allow it to grow abundantly. It's got to have it. Clostridium sporogenes, we've classified this as a strict anaerobe. So does this organism require oxygen for its growth? No, right? It will actually, oxygen will what? It'll kill it. Staphylococcus aureus, does it require oxygen for its growth if it's a facultative anaerobe? No. But will it grow? Yeah, and how will it grow? With oxygen right here. It'll grow abundantly. But again, slower under anaerobic conditions. So again, this is a comparison, right, of the three different aerobic condition and anaerobic. So number one, you see growth for both conditions, right? So number one is a what? Facultative. 
Number two, no growth under aerobic conditions, growth under anaerobic conditions. So this one is a anaerobe. Growth under aerobic conditions, right? No growth, it was killed under anaerobic. So this one is a, if it's growing under aerobic conditions, it's a aerobe, a strict aerobe. All right, so this is our experiment. Um, so I'll put the indicators here. So we already know that staph aureus, right, as a facultative. So there was slow growth inside the jar. This is inside the jar of these plates. This is outside the jar. So E. coli and staph look the same, right? They grew under both conditions. So they're both what? Facultative anaerobes. Pseudomonas grew right? It's hard to see, but this one produces a green pigment. So you can see it's pigmented, this media. Where this one you see no growth, right? So if it didn't grow inside the jar, but it grew outside, it's what? It's an arrow. It's a strict arrow. Um, although that's a tricky one, though, because if nitrogen is present, it can do anaerobic fermentation, um, anaerobic respiration. Okay, so Pseudomonas, we just said, is an aerobe, right? Uh, Staph aureus was facultative, right? And E. coli is facultative as well. So an alternative, this is the last one, I believe, to the anaerobic jar is my candle jar. So you can take a jar, light a little candle, Right? Stick it in, stick my culture in, close it off. What's going to happen? The, the, the candle is going to burn up most of the oxygen, not all of it. Right? Um, but sometimes enough that an anaerobe would grow. But who would be really happy with just a little bit of oxygen? Microaerophiles. And even a special type of microaerophile would be super happy because what gas does burning produce? Carbon dioxide. Yep. Good old CO2. So our capnophiles that require that higher carbon dioxide level. And then just our scientific method. So I'll leave it on that last one for you guys.